OK. I think we're going to get started here. First, thanks, everyone, for your time. Definitely after lunch, we'll try to keep you energized and motivated here. So this is Super Browser 2 Turbo HD Remix, an introduction to HTML5 game development. My name is Seth Ladd. I'm a developer advocate with Google. That means we work with partners of all different sizes, helping them get up and running on Chrome, HTML5, and the open web platform. Uh, I focus on games, and so this is a topic very near and dear to my heart. Certainly reach out to me online, either Twitter or my blog, or definitely at the show uh, after the session or around. I'll be in the Chrome uh, sandbox area. Love to hear your stories about what you're doing with HTML5 and games, so definitely reach out. I'd love to chat with you. Also, after the session, we will be running a Google moderator. This link is up here. Uh, this also works for everyone at home as well. So we'll, we'll run through the top moderated questions as well as take live questions from the audience. I want to get started, though, with a quick little story. I want to take you back to 1993. My buddies and I are down in the basement playing Dungeons and Dragons, drinking a lot of Mountain Dew. Yeah, good times. Typical Friday night. And uh, so he asks, uh, hey, do you have a modem? I said, yeah, dude, we totally have a modem. So we all run upstairs. He said, I'm going to download this awesome game for you. So we said, OK. So we run upstairs, and uh, we yell down, don't pick up the phone, which is how you got on the internet back in those days. And uh, so after a couple hours, we ran back upstairs, and we he unzipped and he says, get ready, check this out. And what game is it? But it's Doom. Doom, yes. Doom <laughs> defined the first person shooter genre. This game totally blew us away. We stayed up all night playing this game. It was our first all nighter for games. And so it, our Dungeon and Dragon meetups turned into LAN parties. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, I went home, bought all the different levels, upgraded my machine, bought everything it ever made. I mean, this was a really, really, this was an impactful moment for gaming, especially for me and my friends. So what can that little story kind of teach us and set us up for the talk? Well, certainly, you can see there with even BBSs back in those days, digital distribution is key. Uh, EA CEO just recently said, virtually everything we're doing now is against the digital opportunity. It's where we see our growth. So even BBSs back then and the web today, just click and play. Digital distribution is awesome. Uh, as, I, as you heard, I bought everything id ever made, all the Quake episodes, all the Doom episodes, Shareware, you name it, got really into it. Uh, gamers spend money. For instance, just a recent report here, US virtual goods market will reach $2.1 billion overall in 2011. And this is just virtual goods. Games monetize in a variety of different ways, in-app, subscription, microtrans, virtual goods. So gamers spend money. As I'm sure many of you also have, you've upgraded your video cards, your CPUs, et cetera. Gamers upgrade. You upgrade your console systems. And I believe that this trend continues onto the web today, where gamers will upgrade their browsers. And so I want to encourage all of us to think of it that way as we build our great HTML5 games. Users will come to you if your game is awesome. But probably the most important part is games create emotional responses, really emotional memories. And I still have that feeling of staying up all night with all my buddies, playing the game all the way through, totally amazed, you know, bloodshot in the morning. This is a really good feeling. Uh, I'm sure many of you also remember that time you beat that level after 150 different tries, or you finally beat that arcade game with your friend. I mean, th these are really powerful emotional responses. And that's something you want to capitalize on when you add games into your toolkit for your products and services. So what are we up to today? Well, we're going to learn how to build a simple HTML5 game. So we're going to teach you the tools to add game development into your toolkit so that you can create happy and engaged users. But really, we're going to blow up some aliens. So remember, this is a 101 talk. So this is targeted towards the JavaScript developer, the web developer, maybe you know some jQuery. Maybe you built some interactive websites. You probably maybe built an app or two. But you've never done any game development. This is the talk for you. We're going to go from zero to hero, from start to finish, all the way through in about 45, 50 minutes. So let's get started. Let's build a game. The game that we're going to build from start to finish is this little gem I whipped up here called Bad Aliens. Uh, aliens are coming in, attacking our ship, or our, our planet. And if we had audio, yeah. No. OK, well, really cool audio. Kabooey! All right, that's, that's more like it. Excellent. And we're going to do this from beginning to finish. So it's a fairly straightforward game, kind of simple here, but there's a lot of moving parts. So let's break it down here. Uh, throughout today's talk, we're going to build the uh, space using Canvas. We're going to figure out how to draw images like the aliens and the explosions. We're going to add movement and animations. We're going to set up our correct timing in the game. We're going to have image rotation. We're going to reduce work by using off-screen canvases, turret and mouse tracking with input control, shooting, 
uh, lasers exploding with animation, collision detection, sounds, of course, scorekeeping. We're going to figure out how to monitor the performance, and we're going to make the whole game work offline. And we're going to start that right now. Our first objective here is to bootstrap the game. We're going to do that by employing HTML5 Canvas. Canvas is a 2D drawing surface. You can think of it like a bitmap surface. It's an immediate mode drawing surface. That means everything that you draw onto the canvas immediately is applied. You can think of it like you have a paintbrush and you paint on a piece of paper. That paint is there. You can't get that off. Contrast this a little bit with something like SVG, where SVG is more DOM-based, and you can you know, manipulate the nodes in SVG, and it'll kind of reapply itself. But Canvas is immediate mode. Canvas has primitive APIs, or APIs for primitives like lines, uh, arcs, gradients, and the one we're going to use a lot in this game where you can draw images straight onto Canvas. Canvas also support, supports transformation and scaling where you can manipulate the coordinate space uh, and the coordinate system directly on the Canvas as well. It's important to point out that Canvas is being hardware accelerated in modern browsers, and this will continue. And so this is very good for performance for HTML5 games. And you're probably wondering, well, what about WebGL? WebGL is a 3D context that's a native 3D into your browser. It's uh, essentially OpenGL ES 2.0, uh, all driven by JavaScript. WebGL is very important, especially for gaming. Um, and it's a little complex uh, for the normal JavaScript developer. And so you'll see APIs beginning to appear that kind of raise the abstraction level, make it a little bit more approachable. Uh, you'll see WebGL being very important for 2D as well as 3D games. But for today, we're going to focus on Canvas. So the Canvas code, very simple. We have a simple HTML5 document here, and we just declare the Canvas as an element in our document and set the width and height. And that's all we need to have 100% more void of space. Doesn't look like much, but we got to start somewhere. So next, now that we have space, we want to figure out how do we render images on here. Well, we're going to draw images directly onto the Canvas. We also want to make sure that we load all these assets and images before we start the game. As you know, images come in essentially asynchronously or in parallel, and so we want to queue them all up and download them, wait for them, and then start. As you notice, the planet is in the center of the screen. We would need to figure out how to draw that planet square in the center there. So we're going to introduce an asset manager. An asset manager queues up the downloads. He waits for them to all to finish or error out, and then signals that our game will start. To draw images, we're going to use Canvas's draw image call, which takes one of those images we download in an XY coordinate, and we'll draw it straight onto Canvas. It's important to understand that this X and Y, from Canvas's perspective, is the upper left of that image. And as you saw here, everything needs to be centered around that point, and we'll show you how to do the offsets. And then because the planet is in the center of the screen, to make our lives a lot easier, we're going to use Canvas's translate to move that coordinate system. So looking at the asset management code, this is really straightforward stuff, but we're going to be able to queue up the downloads. And we're going to be able to ask the asset manager, is it done? And he just asks, uh, did everything either error out or succeed? When we're ready to go ahead and kick off all the downloads, it just loops through all of our entities, sets up the appropriate success and failure callbacks. And then here in the highlighted code, we increment our counters. And then we can check after every callback, are we actually done now? And if so, let's fire off the game. Now, as I mentioned, the, we want to move that planet into the center. Now, Canvas, by default, has 0, 0 in the upper left. This is, its, this is his Canvas uh, default orientation. But we want it right in the center, because as you can see, everything's kind of coming in towards the center. So to make our lives more easier and to think about the gameplay more like a Cartesian plane where 0, 0 is in the center, we need to move that. Canvas translation to the rescue. You can see a sample image here I got from the great MDC website. We're going to use an offset that actually moves that 0, 0 point down for us. So putting it all together in Asset Manager, we're going to ask it to queue up the download. And then when we're ready to so download all and give it a callback, when download all succeeds, we're going to go get that asset from Asset Manager. We're going to translate our coordinate system here, you can see, where we just essentially take Canvas's width and height, divide by 2, and that moves us into right into the center. That's 0, 0 now. And then we're going to draw the image. Now, we want the planet at 0, 0. But remember, Canvas draws images from the upper left. So that's the further offset here, where we take these sprites width and height, divide by 2. And then, as we see here, planet is smack dab in the middle. So now we have a coordinate system. We're drawing images of the screen, and we have asset management. Our next objective here is flying aliens. This implies a couple things. Now that we're going to add in a lot of different uh, assets into the game, or sorry, entities, we need a game engine to manage all these things. So we're going to add in a formal game engine, and we're going to formalize the concept of an entity. This also implies that aliens are moving around the screen, and we need to calculate things like velocity and animate them so it appears like they're moving. So we need some sort of loop. And a, a game engine 
or even a simple game code like this, when you boil it all down, you have a simple loop of update and draw. Update, draw, update, draw as fast as we can. That is up to 60 frames a second. Update loops through all the entities in your system and updates their state. And draw loops through all the entities in the system and draws them onto your screen. So as JavaScript developers, you're all probably saying, oh, yeah, no problem. We have set timeout, set interval. In fact, this is not what you want to do. If you use these methods, you are not conveying your intent clearly to the browser. And the browser does not know how to help you. For instance, if your element moves off screen, scrolls off, or becomes, becomes hidden behind a tab, the browser has no idea that, oh, what you're trying to do is efficiently and effectively animate. And the browser doesn't know how to integrate your code directly into the render loop. The browser manufacturers understood this problem and introduced a new method called request animation frame. This integrates you directly into the browser's render loop, and the browser can now help you optimize. For instance, if that tab playing your game goes behind the curtains, if you will, the browser can now pause the game, which is good because the loop stops, you save battery, and you save CPU. This is all good. So looking at the code here, our simple game engine simply manages a collection of entities, and we have a master draw, and we have a master update loop, and they just loop through the entities and call the same method. Inside the game loop, this is the function that's actually called up to 60 times a second. We have the update and the draw call in that order, and we also create a couple times, uh, time deltas here so we understand how to cal calculate things like velocity. Then to start all this loop, we have a game engine that's start. We have a nice little inner function here that actually calls loop and then calls again request animation frame. So this here highlights that every time you want to ask the browser to, to draw for you or to be signaled when to draw, you have to ask it again and again and again. So that's why at the end of the loop here, we re-ask to be integrated in with request animation frame. A, a quick note, really, another benefit of request animation frame is that browser, I'm sorry, Laptop displays, your monitors at home, they're all running at 60 hertz, 60 frames a second. Trying to do any work above and beyond that is actually just wasteful CPU, especially for your draw cycles. And so request animation frame knows this and will try to sync up with that 60 hertz. So you don't even have to calculate the uh, timeouts. So request animation frame is new, and we have browser prefixes in front as we uh, work out the kinks. So this nice little shim here will help you future-proof your code by handling the browser prefixes and then falling back to set timeout uh, if, those, if request animation frame is not supported. Uh, I highly recommend this blog post here, the title here, uh, to learn more about the benefits of request animation frame and to get this shim. So looking at our first entity in the system, this is an alien. We have our update and draw methods in here. You can see we update the state inside update, where essentially we move that x and y coordinate. And then in draw, we just want to draw that sprite. And remember, we want to draw everything centered around the point that is the x and y where we think the element is. And so we just introduce a simple method here, draw sprite centered, where we do the offsets. So looking at that now, here we go. We have aliens flying across the screen. We've got entity manager. This is great, but we have 100% more uh-oh. So I don't know if anyone caught the bug that uh, was introduced in the previous code. But to illustrate it, keep your eyes on the moving aliens. So let's say I'm playing Bad Aliens, and I say, you know what, I want to play another, see what other, what other cool games are out there. So of course I go to the Chrome Web Store, and I'm browsing around the games. So I'm like, you know what, Bad Aliens is the coolest game ever made, and so I'm just going to go without the, whoa, where'd the aliens go? So let's just catch that again. We, and because remember, because request animation frame is kicked in here, when I open up a new tab like this, the game is paused. And we're browsing around, do do do. Boom, they all kind of jump around. I call this the wormhole effect. So our objective now is to fix the timing. So what's going on? If you remember back in the uh, loop itself, I was looking at the system clock and calculating the delta before um, last time my loop ran and then now and getting this nice little time delta in here. But in fact, because the game can get paused, as we saw here with request animation frame, and we jump back into the game, that delta could be very, very large. And if you're basing that off of anything like your velocity calculations, you can have these tremendous wormhole effects. Uh, that's not good. So we're going to introduce our own timer, our own in-game clock. We're going to ignore the system clock, and we're going to clamp these deltas here to a well-known consistent state. So we're going to inter introduce a simple timer here. The timer uh, in its tick method, you can see the highlighted code here is the kind of key code where we do math.min between the wall delta with a system time be diff between the loop is, or our max step. So this is really good because now we can pause the game, everything moves in lockstep, and this actually sets us up for great multiplayer action as well as we have a game clock now, independent of system clock, so you can tell events will happen at a particular time in the game, independent of people's FPS rates or machine speeds or whatnot. 
So inside the loop, we remove all that uh, crufty time code and we put in a simple clock tick. This gets, uh, just gets set from timer.tick. And then back over in alien.update, we can use this clock tick in, uh, in replace of the older system clock delta to calculate speed and velocity. So now we have 100% less wormholes. And they're slower here only because I didn't sync up the timing. So, so let's, uh, let's go back to, uh, we're going to pause the game. Let's pause the game. And everything picks up exactly where it was. So now we have a consistent in-game time. Our next objective, though, here to fix is we want to orient alien ships. We're not quite as menacing as we possibly could. We want them facing down Earth. So right now they're all just pointing down. Uh, we want them to be all pointing towards that zero, zero point. So Canvas the Rescue again with this nice rotate call. Rotate takes a radians and will rotate clockwise. Uh, the important point here, though, is rotate actually rotates the entire Canvas coordinate system. So we, do, we don't use rotate to rotate the image and then draw necessarily. We actually move the entire coordinate system for Canvas around from that origin point, draw the image. So here's a good, uh, good image also from the MDC site as well. So the couple steps here to make this happen correctly. Our first step here in the red, we're going to translate our uh, context to the x and y coordinate of our sprites. We're going to move everything relative to where we want to draw. So you can see here, when we draw, we're at the upper left hand of the image, but at least we're drawing pretty close to where we want. In step two, we add in the rotation. So you can see here now the image is rotated, but he's still offset. So then in step three, we have the translate, we have the rotate, but then we have to draw that image offset based on his width and height minus two again. And now we're drawing the image rotated and exactly on top of the point where we want to draw. We can add that code now back over to alien.draw. And you can see here we wrap all this fancy manipulation here with save and restore. So Canvas, again, to the rescue, allows us to push and pop the state inside Canvas so that we can manipulate accordingly. We can translate and rotate all we want. And then if we restore, we can pop off. That is, uh, undo any of the changes we made so that further calls to the context uh, are un unaffected by any of these changes. So here we have 100% more Im correct image rotation. Great. OK. Moving on. We are going to optimize the Canvas code and save battery. So it turns out that one of the roots of all evil of computer programming is early um, optimization. Excuse me. But we know that drawing to the canvas is actually the toughest part of our game here. So we want to optimize this code. So we're going to introduce a cool concept called off-screen canvas. Off-screen canvas allows us to create a canvas um, not visible on the browser, but still attached to our DOM. We can draw things onto this off-screen canvas and then use the canvas like an image. So here in this code, we have rotate and cache, where we, do, we create our off-screen canvas. We do the same rotation and translation you saw earlier, but then we return the canvas and not the image. Here in Alien, we call rotate and cache, where we get the image from the asset manager. We do the rotation and cache once and return it to the sprite, uh, return it as a sprite. Now, this sprite, which itself is a canvas, can be treated like an image and drawn over and over. This is great because if you think about it, we have lots of aliens looping around the screen. Each one, 60 times a second, was being translated and rotated and drawn. So certainly we can do better than that. Rotation, cache only once. Turns out it's a very big improvement. Here, uh, I just looked uh, with the developer tools and uh, 10 seconds of gameplay. And we have on the right, no caching. That is, we do the rotation and uh, transformation every time for every alien. And on the left here, we introduce that off-screen off canvas caching. Only four milliseconds in all that 10 seconds was being spent. Huge performance gains. It should be noted that once more canvases become hardware accelerated, this difference will uh, minimize a little bit. But still, it's a good technique to do any work they would do over and over again only once and cache it. So now we have 100% more effective image rotation. The game still plays correctly, and we're using a lot less CPU speed. OK, now we had to add in our planetary defense forces, which implies we need to add our turret. And to add our turret to move around, we need to add in input handling. So we're going to listen for clicks and mouse moves here. But as we will see in a moment, those clicks, as we get from the raw event callbacks, the x and y coordinate isn't relative to our game coordinate space. We need to do some offsets there. 
And as web developers, you're probably familiar with doing on mouse move or on click and then handling whatever it is you need to do inside that callback. But it turns, uh, it turns out in games, you don't really want to do that. You want to let the update loop manage all the state for you. You don't want to manipulate the state of your entities in the actual event callback for things like click and mouse move. So we're going to store the click or store the fact we have a mouse position and actually process it later in the update loop. So now that we can ask the game engine to start input, we have both input handlers, both click and mouse move, and we call get x and y, which is the method that we wrote to translate the x and y that we get from the callbacks back into game coordinate space. So to look at what this means, here is the raw client.x and, of course, client.y code. If I were to click more or less right in the center, my x is 524 and y is 399. That's not exactly 0, 0 or close to it. So we need to figure out how to offset that. First thing we need to do is call get bounding client rect and do that offset first. And as you can see here, we're at 516, 391, a little bit closer. Uh, that offset is essentially the white border around between the documents page, uh, document window, and then the canvas itself. And then the final offset here, we're going to take that and then offset again from the canvas's width and height divided by two. And it turns out I clicked pretty close at four and seven. So do you need to do this? No, but it's really helpful to get that x and y those points relative to your in-game coordinate system just makes everything a lot easier. So here, turning that into code, same code that we just saw, and we can return the, tra uh, the, the offset x and y. Now over in Sentry, which is that turret that follows our mouse, we can say if there is a game.mouse, that is if we have some sort of movement, I can go ahead and use the game's mouse y and mouse x and calculate accordingly. Now, we want the game loop to be refreshed every time. So at the end of that game loop, we need to clear out, any, for instance, the clicks. So that if I didn't click, the game doesn't remember I had a click. So just always reset the state at the end of that game loop. So now we should have a turret and a great, and it's following my mouse around. So now we have mouse movement. And now that we added mouse click handling, we can now start shooting lasers. So we want to start handling the click, shoot some lasers. But now that we have aliens flying around everywhere and we have all these laser bullets flying around everywhere, we need to start thinking about, well, do I need to manage these things when they fall off the screen? So we're going to introduce the concept of remove from world bit. This is a pretty simple bit here that the game engine can check. And if it's true, he knows to remove it as one of the managed entities. So over in Sentry, remember in the update loop is where you actually handle the click and do the work. So we say, if there is a game.click, then call shoot. And over in shoot, we create a bullet and give it to the game engine so he can start being managed and updated and, and drawn. Over in bullet, we detect if we come off the screen. And if so, we set our move from world equals true. And then over there in game engine, we can loop again after we do our main update loop and then loop again, say, did anything get flagged for removal after our main update loop? Now, this obviously isn't like super optimized code or anything, but for the purposes of uh, our simple game here, this works great. All right, so we should have. You should reload. Uh oh. There we go. If it doesn't come up, we'll keep going. Okay, we'll come back to that one. Let's see if it pops in. OK, pretending we had cool firing lasers there. Uh, we want to make those hypothetical lasers explode. So to do that, we're going to end, uh, add to the concept of an animation class. Animation class will handle something called a sprite sheet. And I'm just going to check here, not there. OK. Um, a sprite sheet is a collection of animation frames all stitched together so that the animation class can work through it step by step and draw it quickly makes it look like an animation. The nice thing by uh, stitching everything together to create one asset versus 10, 20, or 30 is a lot less resources going over the wire. This is a good thing for performance. Um, and this is a concept familiar to game developers, so sprite sheets are very handy. It turns out that cam uh, Canvas's draw image uh, takes advantage of this quite nicely because one of the overloaded calls here can take a certain subsection of your image, that is your sprite sheet, pick that up, and then draw it on the canvas. And so, uh, to your main game canvas. So it can work itself through quite nicely. So this is what uh, an example animation class would look like in draw frame. He knows the time through the game. This is another reason why the game timer is so important. And then we call canvas's draw image, which knows what current frame we're on, so we can calculate exactly how far into the sprite sheet we need to go, pick up just that subsection, subregion, and then draw it on our main canvas. 
The animation class would probably also know something like uh, what current frame and are we done with the animation or not. So over in bullet explosion now, his draw method, we just simply delegate to his animation class where we draw a frame inside draw. Now you're asking, where did bullet explosion come from? Well, a great uh, technique here in game development is you can actually change uh, or swap entities in and out. So instead of in the bullet class, for instance, saying, if I'm exploding, do this, and if I'm not exploding, do that, which gets a little complicated, it has very complex interactions, a neat technique here is to just remove one entity, swap in another entity right on top of them, uh, and your user never knows, and it's just much more simpler to manage different entities. So here, we add a bullet explosion entity, and then remove the bullet entity. Okay, so now we're good. So now we have shooting, we have bullets flying through space, we have explosions. You can see the animation class work through the frames. And I also use con uh, Canvas's scale method. So as I move through the, the animation, I also scale it up and up and up. So this is pretty cool, but I think we can do better. We want sounds, those cool explosions. So uh, HTML5 audio, not quite there yet for game development. There's a lot written on this subject. Uh, and ask you to go definitely research this yourself. I think the good news here is that this message has been heard. So there's some patches floating for Chrome that should fix some of the major issues. Uh, the W3C, for instance, is starting up their own audio wording, working group to look at what a more robust audio API might look like. But back in real life, we want to get this game working. We need to use Sound Manager 2. Sound Manager 2 is a really neat uh, simple API for playing sounds. It will delegate to Flash and will actually also delegate to HTML5 audio. So you can write code today that is future-proof. We're going to integrate uh, Sound Manager into our Asset Manager. Pretty straightforward. Uh, one of the tricks here is you're going to want to set auto load to true so that you can pre-download all of your images and pre-download all of your songs or sounds uh, so Asset Manager knows how to kick off your game when all resources are done downloading. And then it's very simple. You can ask the Asset Manager, go ahead and get the sound, and then call play. And at this point, we're in, the, uh, we're in Sound Manager 2 world, and he'll go ahead and play. So let's see what it looks, sounds like here. All right, OK, now we're cruising. Those are pretty satisfying explosions. <laughs> that was pretty good, good bass. OK, um, now we're all set up to actually blow up the aliens. So we need to add a collision detection algorithm here. For a simple game, we're actually going to implement a very simple and easy circle intersection algorithm. We're going to give every object a radius. And from that radius, we can determine if the two circles that represent the objects collide. This obviously doesn't work in all cases, but for this simple game, it'll work great. So to do this inside bullet explosion, in his update method, we're going to loop again through all the aliens on the screen and say, hey, are you caught in my explosion? Are you caught in my explosion? And if so, we're going to increment our score and then trigger the explosion game logic. So this works for our simple game here, uh, because there's not that many entities on the system. However, uh, you'll, one of the early optimizations you'll probably do is end up implementing something like spatial partitioning, which cuts up your game board or your canvas into subregions, and you track which entity is in which subregion. And then when you go to do a collision detection, you have a um, much more narrow kind of viewport into your world, and you don't have to check every entity. Uh, so one pro tip that I often like to do is for all the entities in my game, uh, when I do something like this, I can do visual debugging and draw a circle around my entity that just aids me in understanding where I'm drawing things and uh, visually debug if the collision detection works. So for instance here, just shows you how easy it is to draw a circle around something. And if I set this one bit, show outlines, all my entities will be outlined. So now we have, you can see the uh, circles around the screen, hopefully, maybe not. Um, but we should be able to fire away. All right, awesome. OK, so now we have collision detection, extra sounds for the alien explosion itself. Excellent. And uh, all right, great. So now that we are actually to blow up some aliens, we're tracking some score. We want to see, what's my score? How am I doing? So for our purposes of our simple game here, we're going to use Canvas's fill text. Fill text will draw text straight onto the canvas, very straightforward, very simply. However. You'll probably want to optimize this as well. You can use a technique like sprite sheets for game fonts. The Impact has a really cool tool for this. And then using the same sprite sheet te technique, we can draw subregions onto your main canvas. You can do the same thing with uh, text sprite sheets of fonts as well. 
And then you'll probably notice that the text in your game doesn't need to be updated 60 times a second. You know, drawing the score, the score doesn't change 60 times a second. So one of the earlier optimizations you also run into, uh, you'll probably want to employ is consider that off-screen canvas approach for stuff that doesn't change very frequently, like the game text or the score. But to just show you how simple it is uh, to do, we're going to ask uh, the game to draw a score and draw the number of lives we have left. We're going to integrate that in with the game loop. And then you can see here it's very easy to just draw text on the screen with Canvas. So we have 100% more scores because I left this run. I'm already, shoot, super dead. But now you can see the scores increase. So that's a simple way to get text in something like score display onto the screen. So now that we've worked through a lot of this and we started thinking about performance, you want to start asking yourself, well, how, how actually do I measure performance? Well, there's, there's two ways to think about performance, especially in the HTML5 games. There's how fast am I drawing to the screen? That's uh, your draw loop. And then how fast am I executing the business logic or the update loop? So you can think about even more complex games that might have a physics engine, for instance. The optimizing how you approach your physics loop might be different than how you optimize and approach your draw loop. So there's at least two different high-level ways when I think about optimization. For the draw loop, we're gonna, there's a great JavaScript utility called Stats.js from Mr. Doob. It draws a nice little canvas underneath and gives you a cute little histogram here to kind of visualize what's happening. Um, but that's his best approximation. It turns out that Chrome in About Flags has a really cool way to display a true-to-life FPS counter. And that's the best way to understand how truly often is Chrome drawing to the screen. Uh, to, to look at things like your physics performance or your update loops, uh, highly recommend developer tools, the profiler, that will actually go through and tell you exactly which JavaScript calls you're spending most of your time on. And over in Mozilla, to get the best way to look at how often I'm drawing to screen, they have a cool Moz paint count, which you can query. And that's just increments every time you draw the screen. And you can infer the FPS count from that. So a quick look at Stats.js. This is what it looks like. It'll show you a nice little canvas underneath, draw the histogram of what your FPS is like from his best approximation. We're actually going to add that into our game to show you what's going on here. So uh, it's very simple. You just create a new stats object and integrate it right into your update loop, and then he will draw for you. The Chrome about flags here of FPS counter will show in the upper left hand and give you a true FPS. So it, you know, how, the more you dive in, the more you're going to want hardcore numbers. And so I definitely ask you to check this out. One note, though, this will only turn on with hardware acceleration for things like WebGL and uh, uh, soon to be hardware accelerated uh, canvas. So you may or may not see this depending on your browser and game. Here's what the developer tools look like. I use this, for instance, to determine how much time I'm spending in actual draw alien call for the optimization for image caching. This is really, really great. And I think you'll be surprised about where you actually need to optimize your code. You're probably gonna, thinking, oh, I got to optimize all these different for loops everywhere. And you probably have to spend most of your time figuring out how to draw less. And this will confirm that for you. So 100% more, how are we doing? So down here we have, ooh, 19 frames a second. Well, that's, I think we could do better than that. So I think that's due to the, yeah, being the iframe. Here we go up to 44. All right, we're doing okay. Here come the aliens. Wee. Cool. So anyway, a good perspective into the performance of your game. And our final objective here is offline play. Uh, a lot has been talked about offline for the HTML5 tools and, and uh, technologies. And I think I would just want to point out that we're not necessarily inter um, interested in true 100% offline, like completely disconnected all the time, although that's a great goal. And I think you can incrementally work your way up there. But I think you want to look at these technologies because you want to handle transient network connectivity. We're all at the show. Wi-Fi can be a little sketchy, for instance. You might be walking around. It's just important to always understand your, browser, your user doesn't always have the best available network connectivity at 100% of the time. Sometimes you might even have no network. So we want to compensate for that. And of course, we want to save bandwidth bills for your servers as well. So we're, gonna we're going to employ application cache. Application cache is a declarative way to signal all of the static assets like JavaScript, CSS, images, HTML, et cetera, and tell the browser to super cache them. That is, cache them outside his normal managed browser cache, more or less indefinitely. Normal application cache has a five meg limit, but if you install the game from Chrome Web Store and you install the web app, you get uh, unlimited storage. 
So a couple uh, tips here with app cache. Uh, the manifest file has to change if you want anything to be reflected on the client. So this is an important point. It always trips me up. I always forget to go twiddle a, just change the file in any way, shape, or form to signal the browser, go re-download everything. And also, changes are reflected on the second load. This is kind of a subtle point. It might kind of mess you up in your first set of debugging. But the application cache, remember, will download in a separate thread all the assets. And then, so if, you're, if your player is playing, and he's got a cache version, everything's working great offline, but you've changed something so that while, he, while the player's playing, it's re-downloaded all of the assets. Again, like he's not going to see that new version. The cache doesn't take into effect immediately out of nowhere. The user has to reload again so that the second time he plays the game after the update, he'll actually be pulling from the updated cache. Just something to keep in mind, a little bit tricky. Uh, highly recommend app cache facts on info. A lot of great um, insider knowledge there for app cache. So luckily, the file is pretty straightforward. We just declare all the different assets we want in uh, no particular order. And this signals the browser, go ahead and super cache it all. Uh, all we need to do is declare this as a manifest attribute in our HTML element in our document. And we have 100% more aliens on a plane. And of course, I am not messing with the Wi-Fi gods on this, so you're just going to have to take my uh, word for it here. But it totally does work. OK. So we actually ran through, and that was actually pretty quick, all the different steps we need to go from zero to hero to build a simple HTML5 game. And uh, hopefully, most of that was pretty straightforward stuff. But luckily, we don't have to start from scratch by any means. There is a lot of interesting movement here in the HTML5 game engine community. A couple cool notes. Uh, Rocket Engine, which was an HTML5 game engine, bought by Disney, no longer publicly available. Aves, uh, another HTML5 game engine, bought by Zynga, no longer publicly available. Big companies are investing in HTML5 games. Stuff that you guys can play with. Uh, Impact, they're here at the show. Crafty is an open source engine. Game Closure, they're here at the show. A couple others. I do want a special call out to Foreplay, which is an open source GWT game engine. Uh, this is really cool, and I highly recommend you check out their talk tomorrow. They're going to show something really, really nice. So go check that out. And then the many, many more link here goes to a GitHub uh, wiki page with a ton of HTML5 game engines, all in varying degrees of completeness and features and whatnot. So a lot of actions going on here. And I know you're saying, well, mobile is hot, hot, hot. How do I take, you know, get on that action? So it turns out the game engines are thinking heavily about this problem. So for instance, Impact recently released a cool blog post and in addition to their game engine that utilize, takes your HTML5 game that is written in JavaScript and uses Canvas and will actually get it at near native speeds onto your iOS device. So for instance, it uses the Nitro JS engine to execute your JavaScript natively. And then we'll translate your Canvas calls over to OpenGL and your sound calls to OpenAL. So this is really, really cool. One toolkit, sorry, one technology toolkit like HTML5, multiple platforms. Game Closure does something very similar, so does Spaceport. So yeah, stick with HTML5. Another uh, theme here is you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, a lot of us aren't artists. So I do want to call out that there are ways to get assets you can use to start playing with HTML5 games. For instance, freesound.org has a ton of sounds out there, more than enough to get started with. And lostgarden.com, uh, great just indie game development blog in general, but they have some really cool uh, artwork that's licensed for you to use in your indie game. So we've built our really cool game, and it's all set to go. How do we get it into the hands of users? Quick shout out to Chrome Web Store. We had a panel earlier which talked about this. But the Chrome Web Store is the open marketplace for web apps and web games. You can see here numerous call outs to games here, Lords of Ultima, Cargo Bridge, a game section here, uh, Spark Chess, and the favorite paid app. So games are really, really important to the Web Store. There's no upfront app review process at all for the Chrome Web Store. You can put your game in, and it will be published uh, into the directory more or less immediately. Big companies like EA, Zynga, Atari, Big Point, PopCap, and lots and lots of other indies and other game developers are putting their games into the store. Uh, to help you get started, uh, call out to AppMater, which more or less automates the process so it's even easier. And this is a subtle point, but something here to remember, I think it's key. Chrome Web Store users use Chrome. And it sounds totally obvious, but if you think about it, that means Chrome Web Store is your safety net. You can now build that awesome HTML5 game Distribute it through an actual marketplace, a store, and be assured that your users are using a modern browser that can run all of this HTML5 awesomeness. A quick success story here is World Golf Tour, for instance. They found out that Chrome users play 23% more than others, and they buy virtual goods 147% more than others. So they're very happy to get their game into the store. 
So that's a lot of material, but is this just one talk? No, there is a lot of stuff out there. For instance, there's a whole other HTML5 game conference coming up in the fall. There's a whole bunch of people on Twitter to follow, publish books and write about this and actually make games. Lots of different blogs. For instance, Hive and Gopherwood publish their experiences. They uh, build out their latest HTML5 games. Function Source, the new web magazine online, has a great article called HTML5, Meet the World of Games. And I think probably most telling here is Game Developer Magazine, which is the magazine, has a feature article in HTML5 game development this month. So to sum it all up, just remember, simple HTML5 games are just Canvas and JavaScript. I mean, all the tools are already there in your browser. There's no like, otherwise magic that you need to get going. But let these game engines do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, we looked at all the code, and it might be interesting to build it up from scratch to get, get a feel of what's going on. But I recommend, you know, don't start from scratch. You see one of these game engines will actually help you get bootstrapped. And remember that even id, the guys that make Doom and Wolfenstein and Quake and Quake and Quake and Quake again, and even Rage coming out this summer, which I heard he said that if uncompressed, Rage is going to be a terabyte. So even these guys started with an 8-bit scroller called Commander Keen. So it's fully within our reach to build great games and start a great experience. So definitely go out there and have fun. So I want to thank everyone absolutely for joining me. It's really cool. We're going to do uh, some live Q&A. I want to encourage everyone to please give me feedback on the talk. I really, really appreciate that. Um, anyone who asks a live question gets a really cool HTML5 keychain, nice and heavy and hefty. Uh, see me after that. Um, and you can find these slides as well. And so with that, I think uh, we'll wrap it up and jump over to moderator. And please do come up to the mic. So thank you very much. All right, you're, you're fast. Number one. OK. So you were repainting the, the entire canvas every frame, just clearing it out and, yeah. and restarting it. So how important in the game performance is uh, like using double buffering techniques or doing incremental drawing and erasing and moving things? Like so yeah, that's a great question. So generally, you, you want to reduce the number of drawing as much as po possible, especially with unaccelerated canvas. And so each technique depends on your particular game. But we've seen some really good performance improvements by using, for instance, multi-canvas and just laying them all on top of each other. So for instance, the background may not change. So just draw that once, put another canvas on top. That may be like one parallax, which moves slower. So that's a technique I've seen work really well. But um, do you have like transparent backgrounds for the foreground canvas? Well, the ca so the canvas. Through, or, or yeah, because if you don't draw on the canvas, you can set it just with CSS to be transparent. Okay, for instance. Great. So that's one way to handle it. Awesome. So let's take one from the moderator here. Hi, is there any statistical data about the use of browsers today that can help us take that? that? Okay. So basically, can I actually do this in the real world? Um, so the answer is there's lots of real, um, data out there, like ComScore and NetScoreCast. I mean, you can go find out for yourself. But it, the important thing to remember here is that it's very relative to your audience. For instance, the audience for TechCrunch is going to be using a different browser than the Wall Street Journal, for instance. Uh, so it's important to always look at who you're trying to hit and what browser they're running. So I mean, I don't have any stats on me, but uh, this is a good question. But I would say, especially with something like the Chrome Web Store, you can publish right there and just know, oh, everyone's on Chrome. So, question. Yeah, I'm wondering about um, 3D gameplay, uh, 3D objects, robotic type things. Mm -hmm. um, is HTML5 going to be able to support that? Sure. Yeah, so uh, it, part of the open web platform, part of the family of HTML5 technologies is something called WebGL. WebGL embeds a full featuring OpenGL ES 2.0 engine right in your browser. And that's, that's how you can get the hardware accelerated, GPU'd, awesome OpenGL graphics. Yeah. So we'll take another one quick here. Are HTML5 games just another way to create pastime games, or is it kind of a real game creation? Ah, I've heard this question a lot. Um, so the way I like to think of it is just lots of games are real, right? So I, I, for instance, we, we bundled an entanglement which is a really cool HTML5 game, very professionally produced, very soothing soundtrack. And that, that's a real game. That's all HTML5. Um, so I think what this is probably saying is, can we make triple A titles, maybe on the order of like uh, Medal of Honor or Call of Duty? Um, that's probably a little bit a ways away. Um, there is a technology called Native Client, which lets you run C and C++ code uh, natively and securely on the browser. That's probably more um, in tune with what this person's asking about, especially because AAA title game development studios have a lot of uh, investment in C code. So that's probably one thing to look at. Question? Hi, can I ask two questions? Uh, sure. Okay. But you only get one keychain. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to ask, um, would there is there implementation for streaming audio and or in video, or does it have to be downloaded and cached? That's actually a funny point because the HTML5 audio the tag, as originally envisioned, was really a streaming audio. Like that's what they originally kind of like. You can start playing like a song, and it will just play. And what they didn't really work out is what games need, like fast iteration over and over and over play, uh, like for shooting sounds and stuff. So yeah, HTML5 audio and video, you can you can stream it. So like a four meg, you won't have to wait for a four megabyte audio file to download or anything like that. If you want to play like a background sound, yeah, like sure. That, that in fact, that's actually where HTML5 audio tag does a pretty good job at. So. Okay, and then my other question would be, the tutorial like you had right now, would you be able to have that available publicly so maybe your average teenager can start making his own games? Uh, uh, absolutely. So um, uh, you can get the slides here, um, and then there's a link to the game way at the front, and everything's on GitHub. So you can just pull it down and play with it. But also Crafty is open source as well, and so you can look at how they do it. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Are there any plans to make web apps ask for elevated privileges, like full screen? Uh, I think this is something we've been thinking a lot about. We don't have anything to talk about today. But uh, yeah, I think games do ask for more elevated um, behavior into the system where you can do things like mouse captures. I think, I think we're well aware of that. What are some considerations for producing mm -hmm. games that are um, part of like a, a business type of thing? Uh, there's some games that, you know, uh, Actually, are like a sales for a business, or actually integrate with, um, for instance, the um, the golf one integrated with a lot of different partners and things. What are some considerations, and how would HTML5 maybe be a special uh, place to do that? Uh, so I think, yeah, I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. Um, that's a lot of business deals. Like you have to work out with different partners. Uh, as far as HTML5, I mean. There is, you get enhanced gameplay out of it because you, things like the browser can now uh, accelerate Canvas for you or, or WebGL, and it requires less plugins. That could be a good thing. So maybe the, the sell of I'm going to build my game in HTML5 and future proof myself as HTML5 gets on more and more platforms and devices, that's, that probably is the right way to go. But uh, yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Sure, Chris. Um, two things. Uh, keyboard accessibility was a big problem when Canvas was, came out. Is yeah. the Impact Engine or other game engines, did they fix that? And how do you stop people from hacking your game and changing the scores in the JavaScript itself? Sure, yeah. Uh, so the first question, uh, I, don't, I can't speak for them. I don't know really what they're doing. And uh, I'm not fully up on what the standards bodies are doing with accessibility related directly to Canvas. It's a good question. Um, but Impact is here at the show. We can chat with them. No, just keyboard controls. They were always a problem to, to have keyboard-enabled games. Oh, oh OK. Uh, so, I, uh, so I've written games with impact that handle the keyboard just fine. So yeah. Um, the second question was, how do I stop people from hacking my game score? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. So um, in the end of the day, you probably want to keep uh, honest people honest. Um, so tools like GWT or Clojure or any number of minification or obfuscation libraries for JavaScript uh, will obfuscate all the code for you, make it a little bit harder. But really, with like Firebug and developer tools, you're going to be able to go in. And if you don't do a good job obfuscating your like, local storage calls, for instance, you can't stop the hacker on the local side. So I think that if I take that question and go another step further, I think this, this really speaks to something like um, server replay of the game. So you can move your, and this is where something like Node can really work out. Because if you write all your game in JavaScript, and then you move that same logic over to the server, replay all the moves, you can verify what they did. And then for the monetization, for instance, that's where in-app payment is really kind of powerful, because they're buying all these virtual goods. You almost just want your game to get out as many people as possible, and then you start buying these items. So yeah, good question. Let's see if we can take, uh, are there any other plans to support sequence, like the mod? Ah, OK. Are there, OK. Um, I, you would have to check in uh, with the W3C audio group for this. I don't know what their plans are. I think they're more or less um, agnostic to the encoding format. They're just trying to get the uh, audio to play you know, frequently and reliably. So I, I don't know if there's any other plans to introduce these other formats. Question? Um, is the uh, current um, Chrome browser on the Android platform support the hardware separation? It's a good question. Uh, so just a cl correction there. The, the browser on Android is not Chrome. It's just a WebKit-based browser. Um, and I don't know, unfortunately, what Android's plans are for Canvas acceleration. Are they currently supported? I don't know. Sorry. Um, although you might want to chat with like, Impact here at the show, for instance, or Game Closure here at the show, because they've figured out a way to get all that 
running natively. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, how about using CopyScript? Yeah, how about it? It's pretty cool. <laughs> Question in the back. Uh, yeah, um, I'm indie game developer. You might have seen me on Congregate and Newgrounds. Um, so I have a big library of Flex. I have a big library of uh, Silverlight. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not too proud of that, sorry. Um, but anyway, uh, so if I want to make a game with HTML5, but I've already written half of it in Flex, what's my best uh, plan as far as migrating? Yeah, I'm not aware of anyone that will take you from ActionScript 3, which is, I'm assuming, what you built it in, uh, back over to JavaScript. But I know that untyped ActionScript is pretty close to JavaScript. So I don't know of any, any tools there, uh, unfortunately. I, I will say, though, that you know, with something from the Chrome Web Store, I think it's very pragmatic. Right? Like you can put Flash games in the Chrome Web Store. And yes, this was a talk about HTML5. I definitely think it's the future. But at the same time, a lot of people have ActionScript skills and have written out games. And so I think if stepping maybe one step back, as long as it's a great game with great performance and plays well in the browser, I think that's what users really care about. So uh, my users apparently all run Linux. Aha. Uh -huh. so OK, well, sorry. <laughs> you know, I like Linux. Um, I think we're running out of the good question. Let me see. Any <laughs> Will Google ever make a game? I don't know. Um, any future plans to include a game plan controller supports? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything concrete here, but I think uh, looking at the device API and reapproaching that as far as access accessing the microphone and the, and the camera, I think the logical next step here is the game controllers as well. So I, I think that it's, it's something on our minds, but I don't think there's anything concrete there. Um, I can sort of answer that with Christian. Um, and what's browsers and versions? Uh, I tested this on Firefox 4 and Chrome 11. So, OK. Uh, if there's no other questions, I think we're all set. And again, thank you very much for your time.